My name is Robert Keller. Uh, I work for Altabox Telecom. We're a, a wholesale SIP provider. Um, we also are one of the largest resellers of the PB Exact uh, hosted and premise systems um, worldwide, actually. Uh, PB Exact is kind of a, it's a commercial version of Free PBX, if you will, kind of a Oh, free PBX on steroids, uh, which if you listened to Philippe's presentation earlier in the day, or yesterday rather, rather um, he would have indicated that's what he calls it as well. Um, I don't know if any of you guys go on like the free PBX forums, PBX and the flash forums, asterisk forums. Um, I'm known as Cosmic Wombat on, on the forums. Um, don't ask me how I came up with that name. I have really no idea. It's just something that came up. Um, a uh, little history, oh, I guess, I don't know, four or five, six years ago or something like that, I was Googling stuff and I came across the asterisk now, or I'm sorry, asterisk at home project. Any, anyone heard of that, remember it, asterisk, asterisk at home? Anyways, long story short, uh, ooh, that's a bit loud. All right. Uh, you know, I downloaded that and started playing with it and went, wow, this is pretty cool, and got engaged in the forums and, you know, for the longest time, I was asking people for help, and then after a short bit, I started helping others, and somehow or another gained uh, some attention and, and got uh, given a, an entry into the first finality. Um, I think they called it F Talk, which was a kind of a tricks box uh, course, a three day course, if you will. Went down there, um, made some friends, came back, and then was contacted by the Free PBX group and said, Hey, do you want to come work on our support board? And I did that for three and a half, four years, what have you, and then got hired away from that into my current current position. Um, I still try to stay a little bit engaged with the free BBX community you know, as much as I have time for. Um, you know, all the, all the folks and the, all the players there are good friends of mine, so certainly for that reason alone, I try to stay in contact with them. Um, so uh, just a quick summary, um, I'm going to talk about, now bear in mind, everyone has their own definition of some of this stuff, and these are just my definitions of it what it's worth, you know, you can take it with a grain of salt. Uh, talk about a definition of a premise system. Again, my definition, not necessarily the definition. Uh, benefits of using a hosted asterisk. Um, benefits of using premise asterisk. Common tools used to determine, you know, the land land worthiness of VoIP. Um, as we all know, not all networks are created equal, and it's usually kind of a bummer if it's not ready for voice over IP. Uh, I thought I'd throw in a little bit about the remote user conundrum, because uh, if you're going to talk about hosted, well, every user is going to be remote, so it's usually kind of a thing. Uh, talk about when do you use hosted and premise for failover, and then I'll do a quick discussion about a recent uh, implementation of, of just that. Um, one of the things I just kind of wanted to touch on, because this always seems to be a little bit nebulous, um, is the definition of a hosted system, and is it really cloud-based? You know, if it's a monolithic thing that's just sitting in one data center and it may be hosted on, a, oh, for instance, a Proxmox server or some other virtual virtualization, well, if it's just in one data center, that ain't really a cloud-based application, in my opinion. Um, maybe it's more like this. I think it depends on, you know, really what happens when disaster strikes. Is there something, you know, somewhere else in another data center? Is it going to, you know, take over? Um, uh, as a side note, the whole asterisk SCF stuff is really intriguing to me because that will, in my opinion, now again, just my opinion, is really going to, uh, you know, bring asterisk into the cloud environment. Now, certainly it could be said that there are other things you could call cloud applications, but uh, personally, I don't think quite yet. Or, you know, or is it, you know, um, a definition of a cloud is what happens when, you know, overcapacity, um, you know, when something gets flooded. Again, who knows? Just, just kind of my, my feelings on it. So a definition of a premise system, you know, it's going to be on the, the main customer site, maybe. Um, you know, it may be connected to the public switch telephone network, may not. Uh, can be in an off-site data center. Um, to me, if it's a customer data center but may not be on their main site, it's still a premise system. And lastly, it should be behind the customer firewall, um, is or should be. So benefits of using hosted asterisk, um, lowest cost of entry, of course, you know, I mean, uh, 
Oh golly, uh, what there, I think the, the, the best going rate right now is something called Rent PBX, fourteen ninety five a month. Uh, pretty good deal for a, a, a hosted system. Um, usually they're situated in a data center that's got a hundred meg or better pipe, which is you know substantial advantage. Uh, there's no need to open a firewall or, or you know do anything different for remote users. Naturally, you're going to want to have a, a firewall on the on the system, of course, but you don't have to do anything on your your local area network uh, firewall necessarily at the corporate area. And then disaster recovery can be instant, and it's easy to connect interconnect with other um, systems. And by that I mean like interastic exchange trunks, what have you. Uh, oh, and last point, yeah, it's a little, usually a little bit easier to provision remotely um, since, you know, virtualized systems are, you know, kind of designed to make that easy. Benefits of a premise system? Um, complete control of the firewall, uninterruptible power, uh, power supply, et cetera. Um, you know, I mean, if it's in the house, and, and, and oftentimes when I'm talking to customers about which way to go, they, they want to be able to touch it. They want to be able to put their hands on the box, and so hosted is just out of the question for them for that very reason. They just you know, are nervous about things that they can't touch. Um, obviously, it's inter easy to interconnect, throw in a PRI, POTS, what have you. Uh, good advantage of a better premise system. Uh, you know, reduces persistent outbound connections. Now, wh what I mean by that, and um, oh, I get in trouble every time I talk about this. Hopefully there isn't any uh, Sonic Wall TZ series of firewall fans in here. Anybody big fan of the TZ series? No? Okay, good. I'm going to dog it for a moment. The, uh, the pr a lot of uh, Sonic Wall firewalls we encounter, they're unable to um, maintain more than maybe eight or ten registrations to a remote system with SIP phones. After that, they start mangling NAT. And so, you know, a phone will be registered for 30 seconds and then drop off, and then two minutes later it's registered again and then drop off. And, you know, if somebody throws on 15 phones, half of them will register one moment, half will go the other. And that's what I mean about, you know, when a, in a premise system, you're going to reduce the number of outbound, out, you know, from your LAN to the WAN persistent connections. It, you know, in a small office with a weak firewall, it's a good idea to try to minimize that. Um, this is changing, but really internally it's easier on a premise system to use you know, high definition or high quality audio. Not always necessary, but um, it does make it easier. And um, as a lot of people are really, you know, into recording the calls, there um, tends to be a lot more storage space on a premise system. Not always. You can, you can do a hosted with a lot of storage on it as well, but not typically. Um, I think the average is something like you know 10 gigabytes for an average hosted system. And lastly, uh, you know with a premise system, there's many layers of failover available. And by that I mean you know you can have redundant servers, um, so forth and so on. I mean it's it's much easier to, to um, have failover for. So um, the next bit, common tools that I use uh, to try to determine the worthiness of. Uh, you know, a, a local area network and their wide area network connection. Uh, Speedtest.net, not very scientific, mind you, but it's a good place to start. Ping Plotter, my connection server, and I'm going to show some screenshots of these so you, if they're at all familiar, you'll notice. Network Security Toolkit, this is, a, I'll talk about it in a moment, it's kind of an old school deal. And Nessus Scanner, how many people here have heard of Nessus Scanner? Yeah, a few. Really a great tool to look from the outside in to see what, you know, how well they've set up their firewall, see what kind of trouble you're going to get into when you start working with them. Uh, one caveat, it's one of those things you always want to get signed permission before you start doing any kind of intrusion testing. So there's speedtest.net. Not, speed not exactly a scientific tool. However, you know, if you've got a home user, you can point them there and say, hey, what does this look like for you? You can tell if they're, they're getting, uh, you know, 368K of, you know, upload, you know you got a problem. Ping Plotter, this is my absolute favorite tool in the world. If you, if you haven't ever encountered it, I highly suggest you take a look at it. The neat thing about it is it'll run the ping over time and basically kind of give you a chart and show you where, where the traffic is breaking down and at what hop in the network it's breaking down. It's useful uh, if you've got an ISP that's saying, no, we're not, we're not the problem, we're not the problem. Run this, you know, run it for a period of time, and it'll, it'll show.
who the problem exactly is, where, where, the, where the packets are getting dropped, where the latency is being increased, um, and so forth. I absolutely love that tool. My connection server, uh, this one's pretty cool too, and it's one that we use uh, for a lot of customers to uh, pre-qualify them. Um, basically, they go on there, run the tests, and then we can go back. They'll tell us, hey, we ran it at such and such time, such and such day. And then we can go to our back end and, you know, and pull that report up. So we don't necessarily have to rely on them interpreting it and getting back to us and telling us, you know, oh, yeah, that was wonderful or what have you. You can see this one sort of failed uh, from the screenshot, but it actually, that, that particular network works fine for VoIP. However, you wouldn't really see that on first glance. Uh, network Security Toolkit. This one's kind of interesting, and um, as just a little aside, I keep playing with the idea of taking something like, um, oh, like, like, a, like a netbook, right, and loading it with Network Security Toolkit and pre-scripting a few tests, shipping it to the customer, letting them put it on their network, and you know, it'll run and report back to me. Again, written permission uh, to do those kind of things, but uh, not a bad idea. It, it has a ton of tools that are, you know, mostly open source, not really hacking tools, but a lot of network, um, uh, what do I want to say? Um, well, just simply a lot of network tools that you can look at different aspects of the network. Uh, last one, Nessus. Um, this one's pretty interesting. It's basically a vulnerability scanner, and um, a lot of times these days it's used for PCI compliance. So, <coughs> excuse me, if you've got somebody that's really concerned about, okay, we, we're going to do this VoIP thing, and we're going to have SIP traffic going in and out, and oh, by the way, um, it says we're going to use a premise system, and we're going to open up some things on our firewall so that your, your, you know, the traffic won't go uh, wonky on us. What's, it, what's that going to do? Is it going to affect our or level of PCI compliance. And so I like to, you know, when I reach those points and they say, ah, we're too nervous about this, go ahead and set it up and then run this against it. And um, lo and behold, Nessus actually has a pre-baked PCI compliance setting, makes it real easy. Uh, but once again, caveat, get it written permission to run it on their network because it uh, could be construed as illegal. Uh, with uh, hosted systems, um, the, the, every user is remote, right? Every single one of them is. So there's always a, a chance that somebody has something goofy with their network. Now, they could be all in one location. Often they're not. Uh, many of the reasons people choose hosted is because they've got remote users all, scattered all over the globe. And so it makes good sense to them so they don't have to open up, you know, their corporate firewall to the SIP users. So it's often a good... Um, solution for that. Uh, naturally, the first thing and mo most often uh, the issue, things that I run into are double NAT. Does everyone understand what I mean by that? Yeah? I see a few heads nodding. <clears throat> Basically, somebody's got, a, oh, I don't know, Comcast, Rogers Cable, Co Co whatever, some home ISP has provided them with a router. It's doing network address translation, you know, providing oh, well, 192.168. 0 0.1 on their network. And then they, they get the wise idea, they need something additional, run to Best Buy, get a Linksys router, and throw it in there without too much thought. Well, then it's handing out 192.168.1.1. Well, there you go, double NAT. VoIP will work over that. However, uh, oftentimes you'll have you know, one-way audio, you lose registrations, uh, so forth and so on. In general, it's, a, it's bad juju. <clears throat> I'm going to walk back and get a, get a water, if you'll excuse me, for just a moment. And this is often, uh, double NAT is also often really the, the hardest thing to determine because if somebody was, you know, somewhat proficient in networking, they probably wouldn't have done it to begin with. And so it's usually an interview process to figure out what's going on there. Other misconfigurations, uh, well, I mean, that, that list can be quite long. But often people just really don't know what they're doing with their home routers and don't have them set up right. Uh, this is another big one. Uh, the, currently, for 
our hosted platform, we use TFTP provisioning. Now, mind you, do we think that's the best thing in the world? No, not really. And we're, we're moving to HTTP and HTTPS. Um, however, some manufacturers won't support that. So we have to you know, fall back to TFTP. A lot of um, Soho routers, by default, have that blocked. So they'll have an auto provisioning phone, they'll plug it into their network, and then call me up, it's not working. Well, usually we have to try to dig into their router and figure out where that setting is and enable it and move on. Poor hot desking discipline. Um, a number of situations that I encounter have um, people taking, picking up their phones and taking them home, you know, hoping that you know, everything's groovy. And, and I try to discourage that. I try to encourage hot desking. And yeah, there's a little bit more expense where they need to purchase a phone for both the home location and the office. And then it requires a little bit of discipline. Um, by that I mean they need to log out of this phone and then log back into the one when they get home. They need to remember to log out of the phone at home and log into the other one when they get to the office. This causes quite a little bit of uh, consternation and it's one of the you know, larger problems with the remote user. Soft phones and sound cards. Um, a lot of times people will set up something on a, an older, um, you know, perhaps a Pentium 4 or, you know, basically a, lo a low powered computer. And then they'll complain. They'll say, oh, well, the sound quality is horrible. Your PBX is no good. Um, you know, again, a little bit of diligence kind of ferreting out with the customer what they've done, what they're using uh, helps in that aspect. So I'm just going to kind of run over into how to use hosted as a failover for premise. In this particular example, um, it's specific to Astra handsets. And that's not to say that you couldn't do it with other handsets. It's just, this is just what we've done. Um, on, our, on our premise and the hosted systems, we, we, we try to encourage our uh, customers to purchase the Astra handsets, basically on the strength of the XML that's supplied by Astra. And so that makes things like auto-provisioning fairly simple to do, hot desking fairly simple to do. Um, and so this particular solution is specific to that. No, I mentioned the XML, hot desking. Again, may work with other brands. And as I'm told, there's going to be um, uh, not necessarily a free PBX module for this, but as part of the endpoint management uh, tools that they're coming out with and developing right now, this will be integrated into it. All right, so caveats. Uh, DNS must resolve on the local area network the same way it resolves on the WAN. And you'll see why in a moment. But uh, for this particular failover solution to work, um, you can't really use IP addresses and things. You must use DNS, otherwise it, it well, it just fails. Um, end user discipline is a must, um, and I'll explain that in a little bit. And of course, if they have a, um, the, back to the remote user conundrum, and that's kind of the reason I brought this up. If their network is poor, and for some reason it's not really getting to the primary server, primary PBX, as quickly as it should, it's going to fail over to the backup system, and that's not necessarily desirable. So it, it, there are some areas where it's kind of a problem. All right, so this particular one uh, is a, uh, I'm not going to name the company, it's an eBay subsidiary. Um, they're small and growing fast. It it's a, was a, a fun job to do. And so I put a premise system in there, um, a small Atom-based system with a oh, um, Sangoma FXO FXS card. So I, uh, just a little aside, I come from a school district background, and, and I was always a freak for E911. So anytime I do a premise system, I really try to talk them into at least putting one analog line into the dang thing. So if the internet goes down, they can at least maybe make a call to 911 out of it. Um, you know, everybody has cell phones these days, but that's not good enough for me. Um, I try to insist on getting at least one, if not two, POTS lines on there. The, the hosted system, they, they have 15 regular extensions, and then they have 35 failover extensions. So this is another one of those, those things where I said, hey, guys, you know what I'd really like you to do is keep, a, keep to a minimum the holes you open in your, in your corporate firewall, and let's put all your remote users on the hosted system, and then I'll do an inter asterisk exchange trunk between the two. You won't know the difference, and sure enough, they really don't. 
And again, Astra hands it. Um, the only real manual thing that I had to do was editing of the astra.cfg file and the um, asterisk.conf. Um, and I'll show an example of that in a moment. Oh, and as, as I mentioned, I did an IAX trunk between the two. So um, anyone here familiar uses Astra handsets on, uh, and the XML provisioning? Yeah, pretty good thing, really. It's pretty slick. Um, so in the, in the top example um, is the primary, you know, I've, I've edited the file, obviously. And um, bear in mind, I kind of homogenize this because the, you know, these will be put up online for, you know, everyone to look at later. And so the, the, the you know, the, the top one really should say PBX 0867. And the, and the next one, the, the remote is 0868. But I didn't really want to put that out there. Um, I actually altered a few other things so people can't just go and find those servers. Um, but that's basically all I had to do with the astro.cfg. And then when the phones do their auto provisioning, it, go ahead, it goes ahead and populates the, the backup proxy in that instance. And when it comes to um, other, other manufacturers' handsets, um, I haven't run into one yet that doesn't have a provision for backup proxy. So you could utilize other provisioning methods or manual pr uh, provisioning, and you know, this would probably still work. The other file, and this is a little tough to see, but basically it's just showing that in the asterisk.conf, um, right now, as is, it will use an IP address from the PBX and populate that file with that. I go in and turn and edit it and put the FQDN in instead. And just kind of a, you know, just to throw it, throw it in so you know how I, how I routed it. When you're on the premise system, they dial 90, you know, 92 whatever, and it goes to the hosted system and to those extensions. The, the inverse is just slightly different. When they're on the hosted system um, and want to dial to the premise, they need to put a seven in front of it. Otherwise, you know, they, it wouldn't route. It would think, and you'll see why in a moment, it would try to reach out to one of the local extensions on the hosted PBX. So you kind of have to give it a little different route. So in this instance, uh, in the, as, as you're looking at it, the upper left um, would be the, the premise system. And basically it's got you know, 35 extensions. Um, the DIDs are whatever, 9100 through 9134. Um, and that's actual, that's, that's what we set it up with. And um, then the, the lower uh, PBX, of course, has got extensions 90, 9200 through 9214 for the 15 extensions. And it has the, the same extensions duplicated from the premise system on there. They just kind of sit there in a hot standby mode, if you will. Uh, so that's you know, normal operation. Um, all, all the, the, you know, the DIDs traverse SIP trunk A and go to the premise system. And the DIDs for the pre, uh, hosted system rather go you know, over SIP trunk B. Now here's here's the part, and um, I'm really not doing. I'm going to mention this as a marketing thing or some sort of a a pitch for Altavox, but the the secret sauce here is how we do our trunks. And basically, it's this: uh, we can set up in an account, you know, trunks, however many we want, and then I can point the dids at a particular trunk, and then I can program that trunk when it hits a failover status. In other words, it no longer sees the you know the the endpoint it'll automatically fail over to a, another trunk. And all the DIDs follow. So it's not in, instantaneous. It takes probably you know, 30, 40 seconds, something like that, upon failure. And then, of course, you know, depending on what you put for the handset timeout, it can take anywhere from 30 seconds, from you know, five minutes, depending uh, when the last time the phone registered. On these ones, I try to keep it, you know, not too, not too often, usually 300 seconds, um, five minutes, right? And so how quickly they'll start receiving calls. Now, they can start making calls immediately, but how quickly calls to their DID and subsequently their phone depends on the last time they registered. So 30 seconds to five minutes, roughly. Not instantaneous, but it does work. So in a, in a failover situation where something's broke, uh, you know, the connection to the, to the SIP trunk and the PBX is down and that's the, the failover situation I'm talking about here where the PBX itself is puked in some fashion. Either asterisk has died or um, oh, the power, power supply is gone or what have you. Any, anything that will cause it to lose SIP connectivity, then the failover kicks in. 
And immediately, all the DIDs that were pointed at, at SIP trunk A are now at SIP trunk B. And it'll sit there and do that until SIP trunk A comes back up. Either you've you know, rebooted the PBX or you know, gone in and just give it a NAM portal restart or what have you, whatever you do to recover it. It fairly instantaneously starts routing calls back to that primary SIP trunk. Works pretty, pretty well, actually. Um, so uh, not too tough to test. You, know, you just have somebody walk into the data closet at the premise, pull the ethernet out, there you go, failover. Um, pretty easy. Wait a minute or so, make and receive calls. And there you go. Um, that is the presentation. So questions?